Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join the conversation. Please call us with your questions or comments at area code 808 374 2014 or tweet us at thinktechhi. Every generation has its where were you moments when everyone alive on that day remembers where they were when some world-shaking event occurred. In the 1960s, the assassinations of President Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were where were you monuments. Other events of import were the moon landing, the deaths of Elvis Presley and John Lennon, and the space shuttle Challenger explosion. In the 21st century, I think all of us remember where we were on the morning of Tuesday, September 11, 2001. Hawaii woke to the news that airplanes had crashed into the World Trade Center in New York. Throughout the days and weeks following that event, what we thought might have been freak accidents were really the worst terrorist attacks in U.S. history. Today, Jay Fidel and I are going to discuss the good old days before the World Trade Center attacks and whether we're safer now than we were before they occurred. Welcome, Jay. Thank you, Cheryl. So where were you on the morning of September 11, 2001? Sleeping in my bed. And uh, I got a call, it was early, from my brother who lives on the East Coast. He lived in Washington then. Mm -hmm. And he said, you better go and turn the television on. That's all he said, he kept repeating that. And so I did, I went into the next room and turned the television on and, and there was the first tower hit in the World Trade Center and uh, it was burning. And I thought, holy moly. And you know, we already kind of concluded that this was a terror attack with the one tower. Why? <clears throat> we both had experience with the military, we both had experience with, with New York. And we knew that commercial planes did not fly over Manhattan ever. Um, even military planes <laughs> didn't fly over Manhattan. And so um, there was something really fishy about this. And a few minutes later, of course, when the second one hit, there was no issue in anybody's mind what had happened. And I said to him, I was holding the phone throughout all of this, and I said to him, you know, First, I told him I, I felt a lot of affection. I feel affection in moments of crisis. That's the way I am. I think a lot of people are like that. Um, but then I said, you know, the world will never be the same. In our lifetime, this is a defining moment. The world will never be the same. And I was thinking of, you know, how when we were raised in the, in the 50s, uh, our mother would say to us, lucky you live the United States. Um, this is the greatest country on earth. You should be happy the greatest country, and ringing in my ears all that time. And then, you know, you see Vietnam, and you begin to wonder if it's the greatest country on earth. And you see some of those defining moments you mentioned in your opening, and the assassinations hither and yon, and you wonder again. Um, you see odd things happening, uh, which reflected the early polarization, which we now see flowering out in this country. Um, you see all kinds of uh, injustices and you wonder if it's still the greatest country. But when 9-11 happened, it was the first time since the War of 1812 when a, a foreign power, if you will, a foreign, a foreign group, assaulted us on our own territory. Mm -hmm. And that was special. And all of a sudden, I felt, no, maybe we were not the greatest country, not in terms of defense. And uh, maybe we were vulnerable beyond what we ever expected as we grew up. We thought we were invulnerable. This was a clear sign we were vulnerable. Yeah. I remember um, my boyfriend, now my husband, shook me awake early. He had been watching television uh, before he went to work. And he said, you got to get up. Somebody just crashed a plane into the World Trade Center. Now, I had seen airplanes fly. They don't fly over Manhattan, but you can see them on approach uh, to Camden Airport or JFK, different places. And I thought to myself, some pilot 
got made a mistake and flew in, flew into the building. So I asked him, I said, was anybody hurt? And he said, yeah, it's likely that everybody's dead. And I said, gee, that's really too bad. And then I rolled over and went back to sleep. And then he comes in about 20 minutes later and says, Cheryl, there's, there's been another crash. Another plane flew into the, the other tall tower. And that got me out of bed. And I said, we're at war. I didn't know who it was or what the reasons were. But I was, I was certain at that point that these were uh, acts of war similar to, say, Pearl Harbor in, uh, in World War II. And then when we hear, when we heard that there uh, was a crash in Pennsylvania and a subsequent crash at the Pentagon, I went, oh man, this is over. I was scared. I thought it was only a matter of time before paratroopers were landing on Waikiki Beach and coming to get yeah. us too. Yeah, that's the part people forget, that um, we didn't know the, the scope of it. We mm -hmm. didn't know that this was it, those, those four planes. We didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, and we, at the time, we, I mean all of us, had reason to believe that this was a, an all-out war on the country. Mm -hmm. After all, you know, you go for Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, Wall Street, you go for the Pentagon, whoa, serious business. You're trying, you're trying to do deadly damage to the country. Not just kill the people, but do deadly damage to the infrastructure, financial, governmental, military infrastructure of the country. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, that's the part you have to dredge, I have to dredge out of my memory. It was not, it was not just limited to that. It was fear of a war, fear mm -hmm. of other attacks elsewhere, even here. Um, and, and for a time, at least for a few days, it was pretty scary business. If you remember all that, all that um, aftermath, I mean, the, they grounded every flight in the country. Yes. You couldn't get anywhere. Yes. Uh, the traffic in some cities was ground to a halt. Business stopped. Everything stopped. There was nothing else to think or do for days and days until it sort of became all clear and things began to return to some degree of normal. But for a time, we were living in an altered state, all of us. That's right. I had friends who were on their way into the United States from various places around the world who were diverted to Canada and who had to stay there until the airports were open again. And thank God for the Canadians, because they literally had people in private homes. They were housing folks. They were putting people up in high school gyms. They were providing food and bedding and whatever was necessary. And they didn't charge anyone. I mean, even the businesses who were in the hospitality industry did not charge the folks that had been stranded uh, because all of the all of the airports in the United States were closed. You know, there was a movie or a play, a play uh -huh. about that very scenario. It was some small town in Nova Scotia, a, a, an airline or two were were diverted to that town. Um, there's nowhere else they could go. They landed there, and the people took them into their homes, fed them, and all this. And years later, they came back to celebrate mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. to thank. You know, yeah. the level of emotional purity that took place in, in some instances um, around 9-11 was really fantastic. Yeah. Uh, people finding, finding their hearts. Uh, I'm going to tell you a short story. Okay. okay. So that's 2001. 2004, only three years later, and it seemed like much more than three years later, um, I went with the High Tech Development Corporation here. Uh, the directors went at their own expense to China, okay, and I met a, a woman, a Chinese lawyer, because we were trying to do Guanxi and network and all this, and it was an, a dawning at the time, and um, there was a, you know, a, a certain Guanxi happening between the U.S. and China. It's been damaged in the Trump administration, but then it was, it was, it was clear. And her name was Valerie Yi, I believe. Valerie is, of course, the English name for a Chinese name. She was a lawyer, and we had breakfast in our, in our hotel there, and uh, she told this story. That, that, as they often do, uh, she came to the United States, to NYU in Manhattan, to take a graduate degree in law. Mm -hmm. A lot of Chinese do that, even now. A lot of lawyers. 
um, and it's important for their careers. You know, she was one of the early generation to do that. And she checked in at a, at a dormitory affair, which just happened to be next to the Twin Towers. It was owned by NYU. NYU has a lot of property in the, it's my school, by the way. NYU had a lot of property in the, in the southern part of Manhattan. And um, in the morning, she got up to, to go take a bus, whatnot, walk, whatever it was, up from lower Manhattan to NYU, which is a couple of miles away, I guess. And then it happened. And she's standing on the street and seeing the whole, you know, the whole world dissolve into violence, and smoke and flame, and, and uh, she doesn't know what to do. She's uh, ingenue completely, doesn't speak a lot of English. Um, and she's uh, just arrived. She has no idea what's going on. She can't go back to her dormitory because it, it's right next to the Twin Towers and it's, it's inaccessible. So she wanders in the smoke. She wanders around lower Manhattan, doesn't know where to go, what to do. There's nobody to help her. The NYU alumni were sent to look for her and others in her class in similar circumstance. And after a day of wandering, they found her. Mm -hmm. And they took her to their, their homes, where she stayed for weeks mm -hmm. uh, with the alumni who cared for her. Mm -hmm. When she told me the story, well, she told us the story. It was very clear how uh, emotional she was about it. And I just think about it, I am emotional, too. And she said uh, something to the effect that I, I, became, I became an American that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I recall getting Facebook posts and emails from classmates around the world, uh, one of whom was actually a captain in the Italian Air Force, which I didn't even know there was an Italian Air Force until I met Antonio. But he emailed and said, today we are all Americans. Um, and I, w I was deeply touched by that. Uh, and I think we did see a level of uh, heroism, purity of heart, you call it, uh, charity, that, that I wish we could have more often. I mean, people were waiting in line to donate blood. Anybody that knew anything about first aid or um, search and rescue were showing up at the crash sites, et cetera. Not just in New York, but at the Pentagon and also in Pennsylvania. And they were coming from all over the country. They, got, they immediately got in their cars and trucks and came from faraway places so they could help. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, how often do we see that kind of thing? Not, not very, very no, often. No. It gave us a rally point, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it was a terrible, horrible thing to happen. But it demonstrated uh, the ability of the American community to come together, the American spirit of helping and caring. Uh, it was a remarkable event, and I remember uh, even here, a long way, where people don't, they don't see the East Coast, perhaps, with the same proximity as people living on the mainland. Mm -hmm. um, people really came together. At the time, I was um, on the campaign committee. I was a webmaster. For Linda Lingle, who was running for office. Oh wow! That's not to say I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Republican. Certainly not now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But at the time, I was on her campaign, and I wanted—I I thought she was a good candidate. So I—we <clears throat> were in a meeting, and it was not that day, but the next day, maybe the 12th or the 13th, and we were supposed to be talking about the campaign, but we didn't talk about the campaign. What else could you talk about? Sure. You know, everybody was, uh, you know, totally distracted. And, and she, Linda Lingle, uh, understood that, and she made an interesting kind of um, opening to us. Uh, she said, well, why don't we talk about how you guys feel about what happened? So it was a coming together. It was a group therapy, if you will, and everybody around the table express themselves, and really it was a memorable moment that she encouraged us to do that and that everybody in the, in the group did that. And I suppose the same kind of thing was happening around the country. Yeah, yeah. Hold that thought, because I'm hearing from the booth that we need to introduce our viewers to some of the other great programming here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier garcia This is Working Together, and we will be back to reminisce about September 11, 2001, in 60 seconds. Sit tight. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark. 
And every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me one o'clock on a Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at three, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and Jay Fidel and I are talking about where we were on September 11th, 2001. You know, Jay, while we were on break, I was telling you uh, at that time I had uh, students from all over the world. Uh, I had students not only from the East Coast, from New York and Pennsylvania uh, and Virginia, but I also had students from Saudi Arabia. And I thought they were good, that there were going to be problems, especially as the days went on and we started to hear about who the suspected uh, miscreants were. Uh, and I remember some of our S uh, Saudi students coming to me one night and saying, is it possible that we can have a few minutes in class? We have something we'd like to say to the rest of the group. And I was like, um, sure but use, use the time judiciously. And so the Saudi students got up in front of the class and they said, um, we want you to know that we are sorry for everything that's happened and for those that have lost their lives and lost family <clears throat> members. And we want you to know that what the, what the people who did these things did does not reflect who we are, and, and it doesn't reflect uh, what we believe to be true as Muslims. And it, it took guts for them to, to get up and say that. Well, I had students from Pennsylvania whose family was near where the plane had gone down in Shanksville, very, very close by. And this one woman stood up and said, I want you to know something. My family lives about five miles from where the last plane went down in Pennsylvania. And what I want you to know is, I think you're our friends, and I don't think that you're responsible for this. And the people that are responsible, they died with their victims, and there is no one else to be blamed. And I just, I thought that was so mature of all my students. Mm, that wasn't really true. Well, but I mean, I think this is kind of um, what's the word um, <clears throat> naive, because mm -hmm. uh, in fact there was a large organization, and I wanted to tell you my thoughts about that. Okay, there was Al Qaeda. There was Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. It had been developing for a long time. It had roots all over Afghanistan. It had training bases. Was training people to do this very thing. The plot was hatched. Um, not only by Osama bin Laden, but others. And there are many books today uh, where you can, you can read exactly how these guys came together. They, they weren't Afghanist Afghanistanis, they were from all over right. the Middle East. And they had been building this plot since actually before the first attempt at bombing uh, the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. uh, th so there, there was, I mean, you know, and there, was, there was a certain amount of criticism after the first attempt on the intelligence agencies, notably the FBI, uh, for failing to stop it when they had good information. Uh, if they respected it, they could have stopped it. There was some issue about sharing information between various intelligence agencies, the CIA and NSA and, and, and the FBI. <clears throat> Fact is, though, the country really didn't know what was going on there. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what al-Qaeda al was up to. Um, and we were sitting pretty for an attack like this. Yeah. Uh, had they been alert, you know. I think we were in some kind of semi-isolationist mood. 
Um, and, and maybe that's what we're doing now. And it, it goes with a proposition. There was a piece on NPR recently about this. Is if you want to be isolationist, that doesn't protect you. Being isolationist makes you ignorant of plots that are being hatched against you. And 9-11 um, could happen again if we make ourselves isolationist and we don't follow the action. You know, in the, in the years after, certainly, as I said to my brother, um, the world will never be the same. Look what's happened. Look at all the things that have happened. Uh, you, you could, you know, gee whiz, I mean, it's like dominoes and everything falls and has an effect on something else. Uh, we're seeing the Middle East decompensate. And as a result of that decompensation, we're seeing all the migrants go to Europe. And a result of that, that, that movement of people, uh, Ai Weiwei calls it, um, what is it, people flow into, into Europe. <clears throat> Europe is decompensating and having a lot of trouble politically and socially. The world has changed. And you could draw it all right back to 9-11 and our reaction to 9-11. I was right when I said that to my brother. The world will never be the same. And yeah. still today, you know, the, the events of today are really a consequence of 9-11 in many ways. And I do think on a personal level, uh, most of us are a little more wary, shall we say. I never used to be nervous on an airplane. I would go and get a prescription from my doctor for those magic pills that put you to sleep. Not anymore. And I make it a point to talk to the people that I'm sitting around to find out who they are, uh, you know, just to see if my if my inner fishy radar is is working correctly. Um, and I worry about stuff like that. I don't. Um, I remember one time my husband and I were at Walmart of all places, and someone had left a backpack on a bench at Walmart. And my husband said, oh, look, somebody forgot. And he was going to go pick it up and take it into security. I was like, no, 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 no. You don't touch that. You go get security and tell them that there's a backpack, but you don't touch it. And he goes, why? Somebody might need it. I go, yeah, and there might be a bomb in it, too. So, so there has been a change, not only, not only on a community-wide level, but I think individuals have become a lot more, a lot less, perhaps, trusting and a lot more wary and a lot more um, aware that they need to watch their surroundings and they need mm -hmm. to be a little bit skeptical of what they see. Yeah. I mean, there's, all, there's a reaction and then counter-reaction and then counter-reaction. I mean, for one thing, I think 9-11 encouraged terror because now you saw an example of a really exquisitely successful, profoundly, fatally lethally successful example of terrorism and all these guys who might be in the same place right down to ISIS mm -hmm. you know are encouraged by the fact that yes you can do this you can kill large numbers of people so it's the truck riding on the east side of Manhattan uh, and in all over Europe really mm -hmm. um, it's it's uh, gee all kinds of examples of this this mindless terror that goes on even domestic terror is affected by the fact that yes you can get away with it that guy in uh, Las Vegas uh, killed, you know, what, 58 people and hundreds more he wounded. Um, I guess, it, you know, it all, it, it makes it possible. It's, it's somehow, it's an encouragement somehow. It's a monkey see, monkey do kind of thing. He can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, and the Boston Marathon, which is a wonderful movie about that, mm -hmm. where it goes into in great detail, it shows you um, Boston. It shows you how Boston comes together over that. But my, my point is only is that you get First of all, you get more terrorists doing more terror, hither and yon. Then you get people reacting, becoming cautious and suspicious. And then you get people go too far in that, and they profile, and the police don't know what to do. And then you get people saying, no, that's wrong, you can't profile. You have to be kind and open, and you have to be liberal and progressive, and you can't come down against anybody with a Muslim name, you can't do that. And so it goes back and forth like that. It, it, it's, it kind of destabilized, you know, there's a whole thing we were trying to achieve before. Mm -hmm. And that's sad. Yeah. There's almost no such thing as benefit of the doubt anymore. Uh, when I was a kid, I was taught as a girl that... In Hawaii. In Hawaii, that it was okay to be afraid uh, if you got, if, if you were approaching an elevator, say, 
and it was all men getting ready to get on the elevator and you were the only female, it was perfectly all right to wait until they went and you could at least get either one other woman or you could ride the elevator by yourself. We were taught to fear men because men historically have preyed upon women. But I can't draw that gender line anymore because it could be anyone with a gun in their purse or an explosive device in their wallet or shoes that could explode. Um, it could be anything. So you don't, you don't know who you can trust and you don't know who you should fear. Um, and that makes for a very uncomfortable place to exist in. It's interesting. I mean, you have to develop a new mindset. A mindset of, well, maybe I can have an effect on this. Maybe I can see something suspicious. I can turn it in. Maybe I can even prevent an act of terrorism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or maybe it's a more Zen kind of thing as well. If, if that bomb has my name on it, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's probably going to be more violence like that going forward. And it's like you take a page out of the book in Israel. Because in Israel, there's always the possibility of some kind of crazy terrorism. I mean, the worst, in my view, is when, and it doesn't happen so much, or at least we don't see it so, so much in the paper anymore, where these guys would, they would pass you on the street and turn around and stab you in the back mm -hmm. in, rapid, in rapid succession of stabs in a way to kill, okay? And, and it was training. They trained to do that in a certain way. Um, now, if you live in Israel, you, you know, that possibility exists all the time. The police do a good job at trying to save people, you know, get them to a hospital uh, and deal with the terrorists. But the fact is, it's there. And so I think people in Israel, they have a certain mindset. I, I'm not close enough to be able to describe it to you, but they have a mindset to deal with this, whether it's fear or resolution or a mind, a plan in your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe as we go forward with this greater risk all the time, we also, we all of us have to have a, a different mindset. That's true. I agree with you. But for what it's worth, Jay, I would ride an elevator with you. And I with you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's, it's, that's as good a place as any to end, unfortunately. Half an hour just, just flies by. You know, um, in places like London, uh, Northern Ireland, Israel, as you mentioned, and the Middle East, terror attacks happen with alarming frequency. So it's important that each of us practice vigilance and self-safety. If, if some disaster were to occur, it would take time for help to arrive, so that each of us might be called upon to provide first aid or to assist others in exiting damaged buildings, staying calm and being prepared, knowing our surroundings, and if you see something strange, be sure to tell someone. That's really the best thing we can do to protect ourselves and each other from the kind of violence we see happening. So that's all the time we have today. On behalf of all of the citizen journalists here at Think Tech Hawaii, thanks for joining us. I will be back in two weeks with more working together. Till then, take care.